Welcome to Mr. Brown's Basement, a channel devoted to sharing the craft of repairing, restoring, and modifying vintage electronic gear, and other random stuff. When I get a new, or should I say old, radio to repair, the first thing I do is get a copy of the schematic diagram and the parts list. Even though most radios work using the same general principle, for example, super heterodyne, there are lots of different ways to do it. With the schematic, I can see how the power is applied and distributed throughout the radio. I want to look at the signal path and the output section. All this gives me an idea of what to expect and how I might begin to troubleshoot if I end up with troubles to shoot. Next, I look at the tube complement. I want to know if there will be any difficult to obtain or expensive tubes. The tubes in this radio are common, and even the power tubes that are most likely to be bad, the 5Y3 rectifier and the 6V6 output tubes, are still easy to obtain. The parts list tells me what I have to order if I don't already have it in stock. I check the values of the electrolytic capacitors, in this case, five of them. Electrolytics dry out, and if you don't replace them, you may have uncontrollable hum in the speaker, blow the rectifier tube, or possibly even have something start smoking. Then I check the paper capacitors. In this case, there are about 14 of them. They have a different failure mode, but they should be replaced too. In the worst case, they can cause tubes or transformers to be overloaded. Sometimes there will be production changes or errors, so you can't always be sure that the parts list will be completely accurate. Finally, I check the parts list for anything unusual. In this radio, there is something. RCA calls them capristors. It's a device that contains resistors and capacitors. They go by other, more common names, such as cup plates, bull plates, and PECs. They typically look like an oversized ceramic capacitor, but not necessarily. If anything is going to fail in the capristor, it will most likely be the resistor, not the capacitor. It's best to confirm and locate the capristors, or anything else that's unusual in the radio, on the schematic, before you start. Now that I've got both chassis on the workbench, I'm going to dust them because I don't need to breathe in 70 or 75 years of dead skin cells and also begin to test the tubes. It's all dusted off now. All the tubes are RCA or General Electric branded tubes. I'm going to label where the tubes go and begin testing them. The tubes are testing good. All the tubes that are supposed to be there were there. A couple are on the low side of good. To know how good they are means I actually have to test them in circuit, but that's not a problem. The two 6V6s are not quite the same in emission, so what I might do is find another 6V6 which is closer to one or the other. I don't know what that is, but I'll find out. What I'm going to do is start replacing the paper capacitors. And then I'll do the electrolytics. There's one and the can capacitors right there. I will not be restuffing, but what I do is put on red spaghetti on replaced components so they're easy for me to identify and for future owners to identify as well. At the same time, I'm going to check the value of all the carbon composition resistors, of which there are many. They tend to drift usually higher, and if they're cathode resistors, then they just make the tube do nothing. No current flowing through the tube. Usually start at one end and work methodically towards the other. To make errors less likely, I'll make a diagram so it's easier to put things back. And as it's happened, the first two resistors I've checked, which is that large one on the right and that smaller one in the middle, they're both 50% out of value. I don't replace if something is within tolerance or if it's almost within tolerance. If you look at R6, it is almost 50% out and that's not acceptable. When desoldering a resistor off this coil, the lug on the coil just came off. Not a good thing, but not all it's lost. What I'm going to do is I'm going to solder on another lug 
and then I'm going to hot glue it right there where the original lug was. I don't know why it came off. Don't know, doesn't matter, just has to be fixed. I don't want to call it a masterpiece, but I'm going to call it a masterpiece. I used some a hot wax and then refloated it with a hot air gun so that it was nice and uniform. That I didn't do. That uh, somebody must have done. Hopefully RCA didn't do that because that's sort of sloppy. After I identify, test and possibly replace the component, I mark it off on the schematic or at least a working copy of the schematic so I know what's been done. I'm continuing the process of replacing capacitors and testing resistors. So far only six resistors are way out of tolerance. And as you can see, I'm using red spaghetti to make it very clear where I've been. I've rewired the power supply. That's the old electrolytic capacitor, the four sections. What I've done is I've put in a terminal strip right over here and mounted two of the capacitors right there. And the third is underneath. You can't really see it, but it is there, right there. And the fourth section I haven't done yet, but I'm probably going to put it around here somewhere. The whole idea is to make the chassis look authentic from on top and hide all the stuff, all the changes underneath. I mean the installation of modern capacitors and perhaps moving a, a resistor which gets really, really hot somewhere where it can dissipate heat rather than make everything crispy around it. This section is the FM discriminator. It's a detector for FM encoded signals and almost every component here tests bad. All those resistors are out of tolerance and those two big paper capacitors, of course they have to be replaced. That electrolytic needs to go. This is going to be a time consuming thing, completely taking apart that terminal strip and putting on new components and making sure they go where they're supposed to go. There's one more resistor hiding in there and one more resistor hiding underneath there. 10k. It's also bad. The FM discriminator is almost completely replaced with new components, except for a few ceramic and mica capacitors. Everything was out of tolerance. I can't say that it's a work of art. There's just too much there. There's only so much I can do, I suppose, given the amount of space. Some insulation deteriorates more than others. In this case, the white insulation is okay, it's still supple and flexible. But the green insulation is not. It's crispy and dangerous. Fortunately, there wasn't a lot of green insulation in this radio, but it's gone. All the capacitors that need to be replaced have been replaced. I've redone the power supply. All the other caps and about 15 resistors have been replaced. Before I apply power, I'm going to clean up the contacts on the selector switch, because I don't think they've been cleaned in their lifetime. I'll just use a swab with some alcohol and gently take off some of the oxidation. Don't work too hard at it because it's easy to damage the switch. Here's my testing setup. I can watch the current exactly through this. Got a variac, variable transformer. Speaker is attached to the output terminals. The dial cord is broken, so I'll have to tune it like this. Now, since there's a power transformer, the chassis is not live, so I don't have to worry about electrocution. What I'm going to do is watch and listen and smell, and hopefully as I turn up the voltage to 110, I'll hear humming and then some static. Now, I don't have any antennas hooked up yet. That will happen afterwards, assuming everything goes well. I've got a working pilot lamp there, so if I can't see the, the filaments, I should be able to see that. Second thought, I wouldn't mind watching the B plus too. So I've got a voltmeter connected up to the first capacitor. It should go up to 350, 450, somewhere around there. Let's start. Remember, we're not going to see any high voltage until the heaters begin to warm up. 
Input voltage is about 50 volts. Something is happening. There is DC voltage on the circuit now, 135 volts. It's drawing 1.3 amps. Not hearing anything, nor can I see anything happening with the pilot light. It begins to settle as the tubes conduct. That's normal. So right now I'm around 60 or 70 volts in. Now I've got the pilot light lighting, 166 volts on the uh, B+. Not quite 110 yet. Maybe around 70. I am hearing some hiss. That's probably AM. We'll turn up the voltage a little bit more in a moment, not yet. And I guess AM is working. Okay, let's try FM, or what I think is FM. Probably going to be a lot less sensitive. Lot was saved out of Sodom, not in it. Yeah, and that's, that's a real key distinction. Well, AM and FM work. To test the phono input, all I do is I take a screwdriver and touch the, the input terminal. I should hear hum. That's good enough. Okay, that, that one works. Try the other one. Yeah, that one works too. What we have is a working radio, which may or may not need alignment but does need a new power cord, does need a new dial cord, and maybe something to do with the bulbs. I prefer to put in LED bulbs because I never have to replace them. They have to be warm white, otherwise I'm not happy. The next issue is to replace the line cord, and that is this sad old thing with a new cord. Usually I get a length of 18 gauge lamp cord and put on a plug. But sometimes, like today, it's cheaper just to get a pre-made extension cord, cut off the end, and instant line cord. Finally, I've been thinking about this. This is a conductor that goes to the switch. I'm going to replace part of it with a fuse and a fuse holder. Having a fuse in the circuit is better than having the line cord as the fuse, or worse, the transformer as the fuse. A new line cord is installed with a strain relief, and a fuse is in the circuit. It's not too conspicuous, but it's safety, so I'm comfortable with it. And it's accessible if the need ever arises. This is how the pilot light is done. It slides onto this, and this gives it the ground. This gets uh, 6.3 volts AC from the filament circuit. You can't power LEDs with AC and expect them to last more than about a minute or so. So I will put an inline rectifier and a small electrolytic capacitor to smooth things out. And that will supply power to these bayonet base LEDs these are 12 volts. They'll get maybe 8 volts DC, which means they'll last forever and they won't be artificially bright. 
this is my solution for the LED pilot lights. There, there, and there. And I've got it strung. And a new power cord. Yeah, I think it's working. This is on FM, on a local station. Using the alignment chart, I did a minor adjustment of the AM band and a not-so-minor adjustment of the FM ratio detector circuit. That seemed to be all that needed to be done. Incidentally, you can't adjust inductors with metallic tools. You need to use ceramic or plastic. I can't get sheet metal in town, but I can get ductwork from the local building store. With metal shears and gloves, cut it into size and painted, though painting isn't really necessary. I'll have something to replace the asbestos sheets that were underneath the chassis before. It's all back together and the next thing is doing something with the cabinet and also dealing with the two record changers. wraps it up for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please consider giving me a thumbs up and subscribing to Mr. Brown's Basement for more interesting and unusual videos.